Hello and welcome to the one to two slot at British Summer Time. I think it's eight to nine on the the New York side of the States. And we've got me, Womble, um, Sarah and Debbie. We're going to talk about science and women in science and why women are just as good as men at science because we are completely fantastic at science, aren't we, Debbie? Yes, we are. Yeah, yeah, we can do just as much science as the boys. Um, so I, what I thought we might start off with, I want to make sure I can see the chat um, that that's that you guys are coming up with uh, to pick up questions and that. What I thought we might talk about first is famous historical female scientists and which ones that sort of we we all know because I know there's a there's two or three classic ones that people come out um, and it's Marie usually, Curie. yeah Marie Curie is one of them. Yeah. Um, although off the top of my head. I th- there's Marie Curie for radio, uh, radi- uh, radiation, and there's um, Florence Nightingale. We can kind of count her in for medicine. Um, but I know there's a famous female geologist, well, not famous famous, but she's known amongst geologists, uh, someone called Mary Anning, who did a lot of stuff on early paleontology. But I don't know whether or not you know of any other historical physicists that are female, Debbie? Well, actually, one of my favorites uh, is Emily Neuter. Uh, she mm-hmm. was, I believe, German, and you spell it N O E T H E R. And she was a, a an excellent mathematician who actually developed the mathematics for mm-hmm. Einstein to be able to create uh, his special theory of relativity. So she yep. was an incredible woman who was not that well respected because she was a woman yeah. in her time. We can once more say the, the, the classic tongue-in-cheek line of it's always a woman behind the scenes doing the work that the guy takes credit for. That's right. What, what about you, Sarah? Do you know of any historical female scientists or technical people? Um, you might not. I'm having, I'm having difficulty thinking of names, but I have difficulty remembering names in general. So That's okay. Do, do you know of any? Have you heard of any in school different to the ones we've talked about? Um, no, not that I can remember, but I probably have heard of some. Cool, cool. Well, um, we just had. Definitely yeah, I was just about to say that someone, someone. Um, I can't even try and pronounce pronounce that that name. Um, it's a bit late for me. Um, but yeah, Rosalind Franklin. She did the X-ray analysis. Just trying to remember what exactly what she she did to um, identify genetics. Well, she discovered the structure of yeah. DNA, which helical the... structure during X-ray analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's nice to see how the audience is volunteering more and more names. There's Ilse or Ilse Koch. Yeah, she discovered um, nuclear yeah. fission. Uh, and then Elizabeth Askheim or Askheim. Yeah. Feynman's I, sister I didn't know about. Yeah, no, she she became quite a, a physicist apparently. I think uh, Kitch suggested Maurice Wilkins. I think that was a some, might be a female, I'm not sure. Um I know there's this it's uh, typical, I've only just remembered it now. There is a brilliant um blog that I've seen somewhere that deals with uh female scientists of history is one of the ones that aspects that it deals with them as well as modern ones but yeah. it is something that in the past that we've not been so well represented but I don't know about you but do you think it's getting better Debbie? You know that's an excellent question I think uh, I'm inclined to say yes because I work in, in a lot of initiatives trying to encourage more women to Uh, pursue careers in science and technology and I see a lot more young women being approached by institutions or organizations that are helping them either to learn how to code or uh, to enroll in a a science fair or whatnot things and opportunities that I didn't have when I was growing up Mm -hmm. on the other hand I also look at the statistics and unfortunately they show that things are not getting that much better as they should be yeah. Given all the resources that we have now. Yeah, I mean, I know I've seen a scheme on the internet. I mean, I, this is something I was looking into a while ago when I was 
planning what I was how I was doing my further studies. I know there's a, a, a mentoring scheme for women in the UK that are in STEM careers. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also something in the UK called the Athena Swan Awards. And yep. it's similar to the investors and people that we have in the UK. It's basically a mark to say, yes, we do all these lovely things to look after people. But with Athena Swan, it's to do with promoting women in science and, and STEM careers, I believe, to get, supporting them in having an equal chance at getting into these things compared to guys. So in the UK, you guys have a wonderful woman that promotes mm. science, and mm. she came up with the name I Effing Love Science. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with her because she has 7 million followers on Facebook, I think, and Twitter, and so, and so on. And when I was on a panel with her recently, and she mm -hmm. told us of her experience, how she was sharing science facts and, and science um, ideas, and everybody was very happy until the day when she opened a Twitter account and she revealed that she was a woman, Elise Andrews, because she wrote down her really? name. And as soon as people saw that, she started getting attacks and why is a woman doing this and so on. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty disturbing to see that this happened so recently, only a year ago. And uh, I, I just find that quite outstanding. Uh, and the yeah. people have done that. I mean, I, I wasn't aware that the person behind that I fucking love science group on Facebook was a female. Um, yeah. But just to think that someone's being attacked for setting up a group like that, and it's just it's such a fun and I think informative group on Facebook because it does it shares a mixture of things that are just there purely for the lols and there to uh -huh. help in, to inform people. Yeah, I can tell you from my perspective, I grew up in Mexico City in a fairly conservative community that discouraged women from going into the exact sciences. Even mm -hmm. biology would have been uh, a an, an no, but I, when I confessed to my mother and my colleagues in school and, and my teachers that I wanted to do physics or math, they thought I was crazy and they all encouraged me to search for a different career. So much so that when it came time to pick a topic for uh, uh, my uh, university degree, I was not allowed to attend the physics lectures and I chose philosophy. And I studied two years of philosophy in Mexico City. We have the European system like mm -hmm. in England where you cannot mm -hmm. study several subjects at the same time. And only after two years uh, of studying philosophy, I, I knew that my hunger to know about the world and my desire to do mathematics was only growing stronger. And so I applied to American universities and I won a scholarship to attend Brandeis University in Massachusetts. And that's where I met other women and I had a mentor a man from India who helped me switch in a very short amount of time because I had a, a scholarship that would not renew for longer than two years and I was able to cram the whole physics major during two years. So I, I, I was able to pursue my dreams but at, at a very high cost. Mm, that, that does mm. sound quite steep. Um, what I'm going to do is just quickly go back to the donation topic because as, as Zulu's just magically whispered to us in Skype, we've had another $50 come in. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. It is fantastic. You are made of win. Each time you donate a dollar, you are being, you know, earning $1 more win factor and making yourself much more awesome as a person. So keep those donations coming in. In fact, I'm going to say if we can donate... Oh, how much do, do we want to challenge them to donate, Debbie? What what do we want to give them? Uh, do you want to get them to donate a hundred more dollars? Yeah, dollars. Uh, so someone yeah. commented that they liked my voice, and so if we can get another hundred dollars come in before the hour is up, I might try and read Carl Sagan's pale blue dot quote. I figure that's quite a nice thing to, to aim for. What do you reckon, Debbie? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so we had a question from Kitch. Um, he's saying, as you go higher up the academic ladder, women are less and less present. How do we address this problem that we are possibly losing very talented researchers? So what's your thoughts on that, Debbie? Uh, I think it's very important uh, to uh, embrace a policy 
and uh, practices that enable women to enjoy success in a scientific career. And I'll give you an example. I think a lot of uh, the professors in physics and in mathematics and so on that are older and did not have a lot of women in the departments when they were in, in their younger years are simply not used to different things like when women are childbearing uh, and, and when women uh, have to take care of a family at the same time that they're pursuing an academic career. So as long as we, we keep the policy separate from that, th there's still going to be less and less women uh, enjoying the workplace because they, what I get told by a lot of my female colleagues is that they lose three or four years when they're taking care of their kids and when they try to come back, they never come back at the same level. So their husbands and colleagues can advance way faster. So we need to make sure that we have a policy that says those two or three years that women want to take off uh, can count for something and they should not lose their mm -hmm. st uh, step in their track. Yeah, because it's... It's one of the different. It's one of the challenges that overall face women is that whole thing of how do you balance the career and doing the motherhood thing because it can be quite demanding. Absolutely. And um, I think Sheila brought up in chat the the point that women uh, need to be taught that they can do whatever they want and that there are still still some places where women are not being encouraged towards science uh, based careers and subjects. I mean, I don't know, I mean, well, you've already said that you weren't encouraged for that. I know when I was picking my options for my um, A-levels, the choice was completely down to what I wanted to do. And I think the only thing my parents said when I was trying to pick my degree option was it had to be something that gave me a chance of a career. So they didn't yeah. really care what I wanted to do. And I know when I did um, when I did my third year met, uh, igneous petrology option, we they had four people on the course um it was a much smaller number that they'd had for the last few years and each four person each of the four persons was a girl it was four oh. women doing this module on something that had been heavily kind of male dominated so it does happen us girls are getting in i'm being actively encouraged by my parents for into science brilliant we obviously so, we haven't heard from you for a little bit they're they're both in. They're both scientists. Um, well, oh. science, they teach science, and you know, are involved in it. And I was actually encouraged to pick as many science subjects as I could. Brilliant. I know we were saying earlier before that we came on. Air, you were you're thinking of doing something science based when you get to university as well, aren't you? Yeah, that's my aim. Are, are you finding that there's lots of encouragement outside of home for you to do that? Yeah, um, well, it's kind of more neutral. Um, career guidance in school, if you say what you want to get, go into, they give you stuff to read about it and um, no kind of encouragement either way. You're just told to find what you enjoy and if that's being a nurse or being a physicist, it doesn't really make much difference to the school once you find something that you're willing to put down on your course list. Brilliant. Uh, we've just had someone saying about uh, physics students are saying there's about 15 to 20 percent women on their degree course and not as many for engineering. So it's interesting to see the different sorts of numbers that people are, are bringing out for these sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, what, were, what were the numbers like for you, Debbie, when you were on your degree? Well, when we started on my PhD program, physics at Stanford there were 34 people in my class and we were only two women so mm -hmm. that's um, very a very very low percentage and also that happened in, in many other classes before and, and after me and and there was a prevalent feeling so to speak that uh, women not only didn't apply for the PhD but also did not finish the PhD so they would enroll maybe the first a uh, couple of years, they would take a master's and then go on to be become uh, physics teachers, but they would not pursue a research career or an academic yeah. career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know if I can cast my mind back to my undergrad, um, I, th I don't know if we were 50-50, 
but it certain women certainly weren't the minority on the course. And I know the other year when I did um, some postgraduate uh, sciences, there was, I think it was about 50-50 or close enough to it, um, split between the, the two genders on that course. I mean, how are you finding things in school, Sarah, and the number of boys and girls or men and women on your um, A-level courses or equivalent? It depends on which science subject it is. Like um, biology, there's loads more girls doing it. In chemistry, there's more girls than boys. But physics, it's male dominated. Do you think that might have something to do with how it's pitched at lower down years in the school? That the girls think, oh, biology's easy, and and the so we'll do that, and the guys are then encouraged to do physics because it's more of a boy subject. No, I think it's actually just logistics of that chemistry and biology are offered in the girls' school mm -hmm. and physics in the boys' school. So it's because of numbers and teachers and stuff. Yeah. And I think it's the idea of having to walk down every day to class that puts people off doing physics more than... And I think that's what puts the boys off doing chemistry, um, that it's just having to walk up rain, hail or shine to do the subject. It's the lazy teenager syndrome. I think so. <laughs> I know, um, I say I can't really remember the, the split when I did um, my A-levels, but I know well, the one that was noticeable was in A-level geology because I was like, fortunate enough to go to a school that offered that and there were just a small number of girls doing that at A-level and I'm just looking through here on chat we are going to take questions and, and get you guys involved and also remember you've got to donate some money be awesome be full of win and get those donations in what makes people awesome when they donate Sarah and um, the fact that they're helping a good cause what do you think on that one, Debbie? What Wait, makes them awesome? What makes, them, what makes people awesome oh, for donating? It makes, uh, you guys are donating to an amazing cause and you're making the world a much better place because the more diversity we have in science and engineering, the more all the products and things we have around in our world are mm -hmm. going to be geared and produced for a diverse audience. So Yeah, and we're, we're helping... And Helping people that get struck by um, most people, I think, poor earthquakes get vilified. They 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 just do their thing. They're just a release of tectonic forces, and then everyone says how horrible they are because they just happen to have taken out all the the houses and the like that humans put on top of them. Now, I th I think those those poor earthquakes are vilified. Um, we've had a, a another question from chat. I'm going to try and say the name, Marai. Zilla, and it's which female scientists were are your greatest role models in our chosen fields and why? It's an interesting one because I I'm more of a, a hard rock geologist, and the only famous hard rock geologist that I really said, yeah, that's a bit of a, an interesting one, is James Hutton. So I, I, there's probably been loads more hard rock geologists that are female, but I just don't know of any. I know Mary Anning was, a, as I said earlier, she's a paleontologist and she was paving the way. Oh, I can't remember when. It was in the early days of geology. What about you, Debbie? Well, I happen to love Li Lisa Randall, who's a current uh, living physicist at Harvard. And I really admire Lisa, not only for her ability to do great research in physics, but for her um, incredible capacity to communicate uh, mm -hmm. very complex mm -hmm. concepts in lay terms. And she's, she's done a great service for science communication, and, and she's brought a lot of women into physics because of her Brilliant. Um, friendly nature. Yeah. What about you, Sarah? Um, I haven't really chosen a field in particular yet, but I'd probably say Florence Nightingale because of her, just her general attitude to everything. Yeah. Um, like when she was, this story that I remember reading about her when she was coming back from being away and there was a massive, at one of the train stations, there was a welcome back party for her. 
But she got off one train stop before to walk home to avoid the welcome back party. I don't know. I think that attitude is kind of cool. Kitch is recommending Christine Christine Losher. Losher? I'm not sure how you say that surname. As a, a good female role model scientist. Interesting. So you said earlier, Debbie, about having been on some panels to do with women in science. What's your sort of feel from having been on those? Is it a good time for being a woman in science? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I've been on some panels where some pretty high, you know, executive women in technology or or academic women feel really uncomfortable about being on those panels. They think they're precarious, they should not exist anymore, and and they they're you know have a pretty negative attitude towards them. And then I've been on other panels where uh, women have experienced the uh, discrimination, especially mm-hmm. the, the subtle kind, not the very overt one. It's easier to fight, but the more subtle uh, things that that the culture uh, tells girls, and and then those women do take it um, sort of as a personal um, fight to reach out to other young women and inspire them and, and be their mentors and, and push them to, to strive to be whoever they want to be. And I, I appreciate that. So I think it, it, it's both ways what I've seen. Yeah. So th- th- there's a lot of good stuff coming from it then. It's progress towards yeah, getting women I, I, a fair shot. Yeah, I really like, uh, there's a video that uh, I think it was produced by Verizon, I'm not sure, but mm-hmm. that talks about uh, how, what not to do to this, uh, not to discourage girls growing up uh, from doing science and, and technology and engineering, because they show a girl going through the typical uh, sort of boy activities, like fixing some something with a mechanical drill, with and the, the father just yells out, hey, be careful, you're a girl, let your brother help you. Oh, and I then think another, I saw that one. It's an excellent video, and that's the most difficult type of discrimination because, to fight because it's subtle, it's invisible. Girls don't yeah. realize being discriminated against. Like, yeah. don't get dirty, those projects are not for you, let yeah. your dad do that. Yeah, and there was recently, it's sort of more of a general one. There was always um, a company that produces female hygiene products um, did a, an, an advert to do with you know, doing things like a girl and sort of discussing the whole point of the fact that like a girl is taken as being an insult um, yeah. and then it was just sort of getting these women to, to run like they normally would run as opposed to like a girl and there's like no difference in how the women would normally run to how the men run I know there was, I don't know whether or not Sarah remembers it. I don't know whether or not you would have seen it. But there was an attempt to encourage by the EU more girls into doing science and STEM careers um, by, yes. by an, advert, an advert to promote it. And it's called, you know, Science It's a Girl Thing. And the amount of yeah. backlash that they backlash. got. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. Did you see that one? I did see that one, and I can understand why they had that backlash, because none of the women in that video were actual scientists. What they did is they took women who looked like Barbies, uh, make them wear high heels and, and you know, really fashionable high heels clothing, and, a lab and make them, yes, and a lab coat, and made them act as if they were scientists. And I think that's not right, because it's totally okay to be attractive and to do science, and we need to send that message. But what's not okay is to say, we need to invent, you know, this sort of, it's an acting game. Why don't they take role models that exist already? Go, there's plenty of incredible women Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. they could have used in labs doing real science, as opposed to these Barbie dolls acting as if they were. Which only propagated the stereotype. Yeah, I mean, it's the whole thing of the the, the lipstick and the, the cosmetic stuff flying around. And the the one thing that I just found quite bemusing, as it were, to an extent, or I think one of the bits that I just thought was completely offbeat about it, was given my experience of my own subject, if you know, try and do go off on a field trip and you're worried about your high heels and your makeup, you're not going to last very long as a geologist. It's muddy, mucky work. It's quite good fun. 
going out on a field trip, but it's still like you, you come back at the end of a good day in the field and you're completely knackered. And if you're not knackered, you're going to be soaked through to the skin because it's been raining horizontal. You soak through all 15 dozen layers of clothing that you're, you're wearing. And the last thing you want to do is really kind of worry about whether or not your makeup's right. I, I don't know, at this point, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more from the audience, like what kinds of questions uh, they want us to answer, or I see a lot of conversation about DNA and biology. Mm. And... <laughs> um, well, I can tell you, I, I work on a, a great project called Technovation Challenge that aims to provide uh, young women, 16-year-olds and, and older, uh, with uh, a program that, that runs uh, in 24 U.S. states and in 19 countries around the world. Yeah. And it, it equips young women to, do, uh, to build science-based mobile applications. And girls, during 12 weeks, they learn how to program the applications, how to pitch their ideas to investors, and also how to create a business model around them. So at the end of the program, these young girls that never even dreamt of a career in science are now, uh, some of them even start an LLC company uh, with their apps because they're so successful. And, and so they now see a career in science possible and, and it's a wonderful thing I, I don't know if in the UK you must have things like this as well um, I know we have the the Big Bang Fair which is pitched okay not just at girls but it's it, it's pitched at all um, young people in schools to help encourage them into right. STEM careers um, that's done as an annual thing and there's um, loads of big companies and small companies and there's lots of fun and interesting science things for them to do and get involved with right. so I know there's there's that and um, I can't think of any any specific uh, things to encourage youngsters or young girls into science Sarah might be the better one to ask for that because she's the one that's going through schooling yeah. at the moment in the UK um, I'm, in, I'm in Ireland and there's nothing in particular that I can, you know, that extensive mm -hmm. science of girls thing that's on Facebook. Um, there's, it seems to be generally just targeting everyone to go into STEM careers as opposed to just girls in specific. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see if we've got any more questions that have scrolled through from chat and while I'm doing that just remember guys donate some money if you donate you are awesome okay and you're full of extra extra win so do we have any questions in chat what about some questions about science any questions about science from anyone how about we talk about what makes us get really excited about our, our favorite type of science what gets you really excited about physics, Debbie? Uh, well, I I always think physics will be my first love because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, physics provided me with a language to be able to ask questions about nature. I was always an inquisitive child and my parents and my teachers probably were fed up with me asking so many questions. And with physics, physics doesn't get tired. I can and always ask, why does this happen this way and not any other way? And it has a depth of analysis that uh, I, I have never seen any other discipline have. And so I, I just adore doing research and, and learning the language of equations to describe what happens around us. So what's your, your favorite bit of physics? What areas really kind of get you excited? I adore quantum mechanics. Uh, I, my specialty is in waves. Literally mm -hmm. just uh, waves, uh, sound waves, wa water waves, electromagnetic waves. I, I specialized in wireless communications for my dissertation. Uh, and I also did some uh, quantum mechanics. I love optics, playing with lasers. Uh, again, it's waves. Uh, anything that uh, has to do with explaining uh, sort of the most basic things that we see around us, the science, the physics of everyday life, that's uh, mm -hmm. probably my biggest pa passion. Cool. What about you, Sarah? What bits of science at the moment are, are gripping your attention? When, you know, when it gets to the point where it kind of makes a little bit more sense. 
Yeah. I just I like that about it. You kind of understand a little bit more as it goes on and all fits together nicely. Good, good. I mean, I know um, about GLG, I just love the fact that pretty much like with Debbie, that it's, you're able to understand what's going on in the world around you that little bit better. I don't know, for me as a geologist, I know that I can sort of go for a walk somewhere and I can look at the landscape and I can start piecing together a bit of a history about what happened in that area based on some of the superficial features. And if I start getting close and sort of pulling out um, bits of the rocks and, you know, whatever else is around nearby um, that's exposed, I can start looking at you know, the, the earlier history of the region, you know, going back several million years or hundreds of millions of years and I think we have a question for Debbie how do you feel about the quantum woo bridge oh, quantum woo brigade so Deepak Chopra etc yes thank you so much for answering the, uh, asking that question because I can tell you I don't sleep at night uh, because of this man, uh, there, I'm not an aggressive person by nature. But if I see Deepak Chopra on the street, I don't know. I don't think I would be responsible for what I would tell him. I am uh, very, very upset at the fact that the man and his followers, and he himself is worth eighty million dollars, and he's a genius at selling complete bullshit. Excuse my language. And uh, people tell me it's okay. Let him say whatever he wants to do. If people want to buy his books and believe it, and I say no, absolutely not. There, what he's saying is dangerous because he's borrowing concepts from real science, from quantum mechanics. He's twisting them around as if they meant nothing to begin with he's giving them new meaning and then making people feel guilty and terrible if they're not able to control their reality so he says for example if you have cancer you can visualize yourself cancer free and so now you have kids who unfortunately uh, have a disease and they're trying to visualize themselves without the disease and if it's not you know through medical uh, science they're not able to to do so then not only do they feel terrible about uh, being ill but they also have to feel terrible about um, not being able to cure themselves and rid themselves from it from his quantum healing so i think he's doing a horrible disser disservice to humanity and i would be tremendously happy to debate him i've been preparing for that for many years cool, cool. um cool. Cool. we had a couple of questions from dave i just need to scroll back up to find them so how about the idea of the multiverse? Is it feasible that our universe has a quantum fluctuation in a larger multiverse that is expanding space-time at a rate we much more quickly than our own universe? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not the best person to answer that question, but I did take a course at Stanford with Andre Linde, who's one of the... Uh, fathers of inflationary cosmology and mm -hmm. talks a lot about mm -hmm. and and um uh, also had another professor that that talks about multiverses but what i can tell you is there is a small probability that what you're saying is true that our world is simply a quantum fluctuation uh you know that is expanding at a different rate than the rest of the universe uh we cannot measure that right now at this point it's all speculation we don't have any access uh, because uh, we cannot travel faster than light, so we don't have any access to other multiverses. So the information that we get is only from uh, uh, the portion of our universe that we can see. And um, as you know, dark energy com comprises a large amount of uh, the universe and what we can't see. And so it's, uh, it's a very tough question to answer in, in real life. Um, okay, I've just, there's just been a question um, from Zilla again, and it's actually directed to me. This is my uh, so they're asking: Does my love of rocks rocks extend to other planets? If so, which is your favourite planet? Yes, I love all rocks equally. Well, mostly equally, except sedimentary rocks. They're okay. Fossil rocks with fossils needs to go back in the ground to get baked again. But no, yes, I do really love getting into planetary science. Um, I'm not quite sure what my favourite planet would be aside from Earth. I think Mars is pretty much a big one. We do have Curiosity scamping around, zapping rocks with its laser um, and, and doing 
getting more evidence gathering, we're getting more evidence of the fact that there was liquid water on the surface of Mars at some point. And I know I, I need to double check, but I think I even saw something that suggested that Mars even might have had an oxygen-rich atmosphere at one point. But I that's I don't know if I remembered seeing that off correctly or if it's just some random thing that's blipped into my head. Um, but one of the planetary bodies that I really, really love, it just because of how impressive it is, is Io. It is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. It's sulfur volcanism and it's brilliant. And it's caused by the tidal forces as it's going through. It's, been, it's tidally locked and it's got a slightly eccentric orbit. And it's that fact, it's those factors that produce the heating effect to make the molten sulfur and it is as i said it's the most volcanically active body on the solar system a titan's a bit of a favorite of mine because they've they've um i've been able to spot that we've got conditions on titan very similar to early earth and whilst the the rocks um in this the one picture that they, where they they landed the huygens probe uh, were made of ice uh, of, of frozen ice water ice um they've seen that it is a geologically active planet or planetary body. So there's quite some really interesting stuff out there in space. So I'm going to have a look to see if we uh, uh, get any more questions. Um, doesn't look like we've got any more questions. Uh, I think Dave asked something about... Uh, what will become more feasible and useful in the near future? Solar power or locally generated fusion power what do you think uh, well at this point I think solar power is definitely um, you know on the, much more on the the mm. recent mm. horizon and, and it's gaining a lot more uh, power <laughs> if I may say that um, I, I don't know really what the uh, how we would create locally um, uh, fusion power, but it's something that I keep hearing about, but somebody said it's always uh, in the 10 year horizon. It's something that's always been there in the past, uh, I don't know, 50 years people have been talking about it and somehow we haven't uh, gotten near it. Cool. Um one thing that gets common, some or not common, but has been used sometimes in science fiction, is the notion of cold fusion. Is that ever likely to be solved? Do you think? Um, I don't know about any researcher researchers pursuing that avenue at the moment. Uh, so I'm, I don't feel prepared to give you an educated answer. My guess is that we're not anywhere near it. Okay, because I don't know if you remember, there was a, the case a few, was it one or two decades ago, in the 90s, I think, of the two French scientists that claimed that they had solved the problem of cold fusion and they'd announced it to the world without going to peer review first. Did you hear about that at all? I didn't, actually. No, I know it was um, over here in Europe. Uh, do we have I don't think we have any more questions but we do need people to donate keep donating ladies and gents um, there's a, another question saying, yeah here. I've just seen it um, if you I'll, guys donate <laughs> sorry a hundred <laughs> more dollars will answer <laughs> and so I've got a bit of interesting bad physics that I could run past Debbie if you donate some more money people okay. uh Fissioning, thorium. Are you, someone's they're they're questioning about the fusion or fission process. I think by the look at it, lots of random interesting questions. Oh, um, we've just been asked about whether or not we've discussed peak oil. Um, that would I think that's probably more my field as a geologist. Yeah. Peak oil. Peak oil is the notion that we will get to one point where we have extracted all of the oil or the the highest rate of oil that we can. Um, so if you imagine the, the bell curve, the kind of up, get to your top and then go down. Yeah. And then, so once we've got to the peak oil, that's where we've, we're able to extract the most oil. And once we go past peak oil, uh, we get less and less. I don't know enough of the oil extraction process um, to say whether or not we have reached peak oil. I know that there's other date talked about that we have about 50 years worth of fossil fuels left 
or plentiful fossil fuels left. I know the UK or in England, there are coal mines that have good quality coal in them, but because of the coal miners' strike in the eighties, um, they got shut down by Margaret Thatcher, and so they're at the moment um, not economically viable to go get that go in there and get that coal out but it's a possible source of fuel as and when needed at some point but then there's also the fact that the problem with global warming um and how that is is causing us problems okay so i don't think we have any more questions do we not have any more science questions from the chat there's a few here there's one how uh, how do we feel about ba bad science in movies? And there's another one. What are the worst example of bad science uh, we've seen in movies? <coughs> I'm not uh, saying that film name fully, <laughs> properly, out loud. It, it, it might have a film to do with um, a certain year that happened just recently in the last few years, but I'm not going to repeat it. Um, personally, for me, in bad science in films, it depends how bad it is. If they're just bending and tweaking the science a little bit, I'll give it a pass. But if it's yeah. total, you're going to die horribly in a fire, Zulu. And I'm going to be giggling as I light the flames. <laughs> well, you just posted up in chat the, uh, the name of the, the film that I really, really despise. Because it has those trinos that have mutated. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there, there is an association here in the U.S. that tries to pair up scientists with Hollywood filmmakers yeah. to try to uh, improve the state of uh, science uh, in film. Uh, uh, one, for example, one movie that I saw recently was Gravity with George Clooney and Sandra Bullock. I, um, I don't know if it, it uh, was as big in the U.K., but... Uh, there, there was some wrong physics there. In fact, the very premise of the film is that George Clooney, uh, sorry if I'm going to tell you if you haven't watched it, but he actually uh, does not survive because at one point he has a lot of momentum and he's traveling uh, and sort of he, catch, he stops his momentum with a force, an external force applied on him by her catching him and grabbing him by the hand. And they're all static, nobody's moving, but then he continues to experience a force that was mm -hmm. sort of pulling him somewhere. And unfortunately, he has to let go because he has no more strength. Well, that force came out of nowhere. There was no more wind. And Newton's second law of inertia tells us that things will only uh, start moving if there's an external force acting on them. And there was no force acting. I was pretty bothered by the fact that the whole movie is based on that, and that's an error in the fi film. Um, that's how I, I saw it. Uh, but there's tons of things that happen with, especially in medicine and, and oh my, uh, so many uh, special effects things that there would, there's no way they would be, uh, they would happen in real life. Oh, I know um, a film, I can watch it now more since I've seen another, another example of a bad science film that has already been mentioned. Um, but I know uh, the film, uh, The Core, the, the one bit that, even though I can watch it, the one bit that always grates me whenever I see it is when they crash their ship into the giant geode in the mantle. Oh. There, is yeah. no, there is no way we would have a giant geode. You'd have a massive gra negative, gra gra uh, negative gravity anomaly, and it just would not be feasible at all. It just the, the, how the, the materials in the mantle responds to the heat and pressure conditions that are on in there, you just couldn't have a geode forming. I mean, the whole way a geode would form is if you've got uh, fluids allowing crystals to become to that great size. And it's just utterly, utterly wrong. I mean, not to mention what they do with the gravity in that film as well, as they, they're going into the core with the, um, you know, with that ship and not getting mushed into a pulp and then they're able to escape on as they ride the um, pressure wave from the nuclear blast that they set off yeah. it's all quite horrible have we had any more donations yet ladies and gentlemen are we got people donating because this is an awesome cause of win. We're donating to a, company, uh, to a charity that goes around after somewhere has had a massive disaster. So something like a volcano or well, more an earthquake. And rebuilding vital, 
um, vital services. And you think about things, you know, one of the biggest killers after a disaster uh, is things like disease. And if you've not got good sanitation and good access to water, you're going to have things like cholera kicking off and other sorts of unpleasant diseases. So it is a really good cause and we really should donate as much as we can. And if you can't donate, nag a friend to donate. Spread the word. Um, so Kitcher said, so if you set off, so set of a nuke, I think you meant off there, uh, at the Earth's core, would it cause worldwide eruptions or as Dr. Evil, a crap geologist? Or is Dr. Evil? You know, Dr. Evil is a crap geologist. In fact, I don't even think he's a geologist. He's more of an evil overlord. Go away, Kitch, you silly biologist. Yes, he got spelling owned by dyslexic. What, what, what about you? Have you got a favourite science film that's got some bad science, but you still like it? Because my, my, my one's Volcano. The geology is completely wrong for <laughs> that tectonic regime, but I just love it. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I don't have one at the top of my head right now. Uh, I'll see if Zulu can find us some details of the Engineers Without Borders projects, because um, I'm sure he's got some of those on his fingertips. Uh, so... And they say just just to remind people, the because I part of my degree I studied geological hazards and we had to do a number of case studies, and it is it, 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 the lack of water after a significant uh, natural disaster is going to be a killer, as much because if you've had somewhere that's you know, a built up area like a city, um, if you destroy a lot of the buildings you've then got a risk of a fire and i know in the 1906 san francisco earthquake they had a massive fire that lasted for three or four days and they just couldn't get water to to it to put it out and in the 1996 kobe earthquake they again had a massive problem with um fire so it is a really important thing. We've got another question through from chat. And how does Debbie feel about the reporting of science in the mainstream media? Yeah. I'll answer that. But before I want to congratulate the person that said that there's a movie called uh, Lucy uh, that is coming out about using more than 10% of your brain, even though that's wrong. And I love that you said that because it's bothering me tremendously to hear it over and over again. And that's a myth that we use only 10% of our brain. And that whole movie is based on that. So it's uh, bothering me. Uh, as to the question of how do I feel about reporting uh, science in the media and journalism, I think uh, there's a lot to be desired, especially now that uh, social media uh, has made anyone an expert journalist in science. Uh, it, it's very important that uh, we have a measure of the quality of, of things being said. And people right now just want the news faster and bigger and better. And because of that, uh, science media is suffering tremendously because people are not willing to pay for a newspaper or an article that's well-researched. And so uh, the, you'll see all sorts of crazy correlation. It's not cause causation type of, uh, of things like... Uh, you know, this and this happen together, therefore one must be causing the other. You see that all the time in the media, uh, whether it's in, you know, medi medical, uh, you know, consequences, or you see, for example, religious uh, writings where people say, oh, uh, he was healed by God, and, and that's why he got cured of that ailment. I see that a lot in, in, in Latin American countries. And then when you drill down in the article, you realize that also that person had so many surgeries and so many uh, therapies and so on that are uh, evidence-based. And so it's, I think the quality is decreasing dramatically and it's a worrisome uh, state right now for science journalism. Okay, we've had another question from chat and it's about where's the best place we've had to go to work for our, in our respective fields? So what's the kind of the big place that's made you go, wow, this is amazing for the chance you've had to go and work there? Well, uh, I can tell you that one of the most fun adventures I've had is I've started doing TV and I'm co-hosting a Discovery Channel TV show called You've Been Warned, uh, which is shown all over the world in the UK as well. And, 
And it was really fun because my audition was going to a studio and trying to explain the physics of crazy things. So I watched YouTube videos of people doing amazing things like jumping off of buildings or building cars with motors outside and all that. And I had to test uh, my knowledge of physics uh, by applying the concepts that I learned to everyday things that people do with you know, crazy effects. And so that was a really, really fun adventure. And explaining that uh, in lay terms is very, very fun. And we just had, I, I was going to answer that question, we just had Dave come in with another question. And it said, will we be able will to colonize be? Mars? SpaceX is building, a, is building a rocket to get us there, but is colonization feasible? I think it's not. I'm not so sure. I mean, if we can get... Um, enough stuff then, enough sort of gases to get things going. And if we can get crops growing on Mars, obviously under protective domes, I don't see why it couldn't be possible to colonise it. It's not going to be easy um, because the planet doesn't have a, a breathable atmosphere, it doesn't really have much of an atmosphere. Um, and we would have to, to do a lot to make it work. But I think it could be possible. What do you think, Debbie? What's your take on that from a physics perspective? Um... Yeah, I would like to believe that it would be possible, but my scientific intuition tells me that it's probably not going to be possible, at least with the technology that we have available right now. Um, the infrastructure that we have and how to transport that and how to create energy in an atmosphere that is not friendly to mm. human life, I just don't see it um, now. But things can yeah. change dramatically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm talking about the kind of thing of it happening at all. I mean, I do think it is possible. Yeah. But I do agree that at the moment, our technology isn't great enough. Board to bits brought up a brilliant point about the fact that the moon would be much easier to do because of the magnitude. It's a lot closer to Earth. So if something goes wrong, it's easier for us to, to get there if there's a chance for survivors to have found some sort of safe haven. Yeah. <laughs> um. We've had another little question from chat. Uh, just to get back to women in science, is there anything that male scientists and males generally, for that matter, do that discourage women from taking up science? And if so, what can we do to limit that? Did you see the question? Hear the question, Debbie? No, I couldn't hear it. So. Um, it's it's, it's, okay. it's in the Skype. It says, um, just to get back to women in science, is there anything that male scientists, and males in general for that matter, do that discourage women from taking up science? And if so, what can we do to limit that? Got it. Yeah. I think definitely uh, what I see is that all the conferences I go to where we discuss the issues and challenges that women face in science, they're empty of men. And we need men in the conversation. So every time uh, there, there are men that encourage uh, women and that uh, make sure that they mentor them, that they include women in groups, in the research groups, in their classes. Uh, they're doing so much for science itself that we need to uh, really get uh, men uh, considering the importance of having a diverse uh, student class, a diverse research uh, program, etc. And I think that's uh, an essential thing. Yep. Yep. I mean, I know I... I've not come across any over forms of sexism in the the places where I've I've worked professionally, um, but I'm not saying that that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. In, yeah, in yeah. sort of UK work environments, it clearly does in some places, but I know it's it is a problem that a lot of people are working on and doing the right thing. And I think the key thing personally is just to make it so that people, um, so that women have got are treated on an equal footing and it's not a case of people just automatically assuming that they can't do it because of gender or whatever. And we've got a couple more questions um, that seem to be coming through. No, it's just conversation. So why should we need to remind people again why they should donate. What makes donating brilliant? Again, donate because we want more women in science. Isn't that a great cause? Yeah, yeah, because um, 
we we'll get the, the we'll get the engineers without borders in and they'll obviously be wanting to make sure that they're employing on an equal opportunities basis and so that will mean more work for female engineers going out and saving the day restoring people's water supplies and whatnot so they're not getting sick and dying after they've had horrible natural disasters destroy their infrastructure oh um kitch has just brought up very something something very important quite quickly uh with a, uh an italian earthquake that happened in a place called l'aquila um we it, it's about dealing with training scientists to to communicate effectively their ideas i don't know whether or not you know about that debbie did you no. see that at all um there was it was in 2006 there was quite a devastating earthquake in l'aquila it's an area it's in an area of italy that is geologically active and i think the geologists under pressure from some of the um local groups downplayed slightly i mean i'm just doing this off the top of my memory i might i might not i might not be completely correct they downplayed yeah. some of the risks i think they didn't want to be alarmist um and unfortunately the earthquake struck and killed a lot of people and That's the terrible. the seismologists in question have been held accountable in the court of law i mean the thing that makes for me that makes it just mind-numbing that this they, they've done this is earthquakes are just so difficult to predict you can predict a general trend in the fact that you know they they follow this sort of pattern but you can't predict as to the exact time and day that it's going to happen that's right yeah i think it's very uh common unfortunately that scientists are not trained to communicate the research to the media and I have proposed an incubator program where both scientists spend time learning about journalism and how to explain com the complexities of the research in lay terms that are weighted by uh, risk. And also journalists should spend time in research labs learning about the depth of, of what uh, science is about so that they'll communicate it more fairly. Mm. I think this is something that we could probably go on and talk for a little while longer. But unfortunately, this is the end of our hour. So we have to go now. There's no more girls of science for you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure who we've got next. We've got on Veneloid, I believe. So that should be an interesting hour. And I'd like to think that we're going to do lots and lots of donating in the next hour. So I'm going to say goodbye now. And thank, thank you for listening you. for this hour. Thank you for being with us, Debbie. Do we have Sarah back with us? Yeah, my internet's decided to behave at the moment. As, as we have to go. But thank you very much for being with us as well, Sarah, and, and you know, giving your points as well. And we'll hand over to the next hour slot.